right. Hey guys, my name is TJ Mack. I'm with Spartanburg Medical Trauma Center. I'm their Injury Prevention and Outreach Coordinator. We are here today at Westgate Mall. We'll be here today until 4 at least, depending on the turnout. And then tomorrow, Saturday the 31st, which happens to be National Stop the Bleed Day, the first one ever. We'll be here from 10 in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Unless, of course, we have a humongous crowd and, and everybody wants to learn, which we are willing to stay over for. So I'm going to show you a little bit about what we're going to be teaching everybody. This is called be Bleeding Control Basic, meaning it's basic, right? It's what everybody should know, but that doesn't take away the importance of it. Just because it's basic <clears throat> doesn't mean it's less important. If anything, it's most important because we have to learn the basics before we can move forward, okay? So the information that we're going to cover here can be used anytime there is a bleeding wound. That's important to know, anytime. It doesn't have to be life-threatening. However, if you have a life-threatening wound or somebody around you does, you definitely want to use this information. But anytime. And it doesn't just have to be acts of violence, even though that gets a lot of the attention, okay? Three parts of bleeding control. Pretty simple. In the medical field, we like ABC. A lot of times, like in trauma situations, it's airway breathing circulation this situation is just a little bit different still ABC it's going to be alert and I know all of you can do this because you're probably watching me on your smartphone so I know you have a phone with you and it probably has Siri so she can do the alerting for you that's a alert B is bleeding it's composed of two parts and I'll go over that in a moment and then C pretty simple it's what everybody does when they have a cut or a wound compress and we compress in two ways okay we compress with either a tourniquet above the wound or wound packing. And, and we're going to go over all of this stuff in the next couple of minutes, okay? Before you get into your ABCs in any type of situation, you need to do S, but it doesn't fall into what we say very well. Nobody wants to say S, A, B, C, so I just back it up. S stands for safety. Safety is always number one most important. If, if the scene is not safe, we do not want you to approach. We want you to remain safe because we don't want more casualties, okay? We want you to help, but we want you to make sure the scene is safe. I can't stress that enough. Once you know the scene is safe, you can then alert. If you're with a group of people, I want you to give somebody that responsibility. I want you to say, hey, go find the bleeding control kit or go find help and call 911. Don't assume because somebody has their phone out that they're alerting. What they're probably doing is recording to put it on social media so that they can get their likes and their hearts or whatever else the site is using, okay? What we want you to do is stop recording and start compressing. That's how you're gonna save the life, okay? A is alert, pretty simple. B, bleeding. There are three types of bleeds and we go over that here. Not the most important to know what the types of bleeds are. What's most important to know, person is bleeding, I need to stop it, how am I gonna do that, okay? You're gonna do that by C, compression, I said it earlier. Two ways to compress. One way is tourniquet usage. Let me just say the best way, you may not have a tourniquet, you can make one, you may not have one, but you have two hands. If you have two hands, you can save a life, okay? That's extremely important. If you have one hand, you can save a life. Just easier to do it with your buddy. So, compress with a tourniquet. There are many different types of tourniquets. It's a fancy word for a string used to slow down or stop the flow of blood. Um, these are two commercial tourniquets. They look a little bit different, but they function in the same way. That's important to know. You're gonna be able to find these tourniquets anytime you see a bleeding control kit. We're trying to get these out in as many places we can where people gather in large amounts. You never know where the incident's gonna be, so the more we have, the better off we all are. It may look pretty like this, or it may look like this. It doesn't matter. What's inside matters, and they contain the same thing. What does the inside of the red one look like? So the inside of the red one is going to look like this. Here you have your tourniquet. You have your PPE, which is personal protective equipment, right? Again, back to safety. There are gloves in here, so wear them if you have the time and you have the ability to, to get those out and put those on. You do want to keep yourself protected. If at any time we are talking about blood, so if you know you came in contact with that blood onto your skin, when EMS or the first responders get there, please let them know so they can treat you adequately, okay, in the way that you need to be. So this is what's on the inside of these kits. It's going to be the same thing. When it comes to the tourniquet, again, different colors. Um, they look a little different. They function in the same way. Tourniquets 
it's going to be wrapped up first, right? So you take it out of the plastic, you unwrap it. With this particular type of tourniquet, you need to create your hole, okay? This is where the extremity is going to go through. Tourniquets go on the extremities, which are your arms and your legs. Tourniquets do not go in the groin, they do not go in the underarms, and they never, ever, ever go around somebody's neck, okay? Please do not put a tourniquet around somebody's neck. We call that murder. When you have a tourniquet and you have identified the bleeding wound and you know mm, they could benefit from a tourniquet, please use it. You're going to do more good than harm, okay? Um, especially if there is more than one wound, you want to slap this on, tighten it up so that you can address the other wound with either another tourniquet or your two hands. So, now, do you need to demonstrate that? Maybe with a, we could grab a colleague to demonstrate yeah, what Yeah, actually, on? I was going to do that now. Uh, if my colleague would come on down. So this is my colleague. Uh, he is one of our surgeons at Spartanburg Medical Hello. Center. Hi, He'd colleague. What's your name? Craigan Currents. He had the best arms. He does a lot of <laughs> exercising, so I wanted to use him. Pretty vascular fella. We're going to say that he has a cut on his wrist, and I'm only using the wrist because I, I like to say we don't go way up here, right? If it's an isolated wound, meaning a cut on his wrist, we're going to go You make your hole. We go two to three inches above the wound, okay? We're not gonna go way up here, and usually I ask people, why don't we go way up here? Well, there's nobody here to answer, so I'm just gonna tell you. We don't go way up here if the wound is here, isolated wound, because we've now cut off blood flow to the entire arm, okay? And we don't wanna do that. This is good, viable tissue. We wanna keep it alive, all right? So, if he has a mangled extremity, meaning there's a lot of wounds and we don't know which ones were, sure, come up high and tight and crank it down. But isolated at the wrist, two to three inches above, you simply pull, this is Velcro, so it's going to come around and wrap, okay? You don't have to stick it under here. A lot of people want to do that because it looks natural, but just let it stick like that. Remove this time slot piece. This is your rod. You're going to turn it, and in the real world with a real injury, you turn it until the bleeding stops. Now, he is not bleeding, and I don't want to do damage, so I'm just going to turn it once. It goes under the C-clamp, and then you put this over top and you have successfully stopped the bleed and saved his life. There is a place here for the time and the kits that we have or that you may come across do have a Sharpie so you can write the time. It seems like it's the least important thing and in, in the situation really it is, but it's, it is important on the back end once they get to the surgeons for definitive care. These can be in place. You hear different times. What we're going with is up to two hours and the chances of him losing what we've cut the blood flow off to is slim to none. But once you start reaching over that, they need to think fast to decide how are we going to handle this. So that's why the time is important. In a situation like this, if you forget, it's okay. First responders are going to see the tourniquet and they're going to know to ask when was it applied. It's going to feel like for you, oh, it's been seven hours, but it's probably been less than 10 minutes uh, in most situations. Once a tourniquet is on, we do not take it off. Tourniquets do hurt, so they're going to be upset with you. They might be screaming at you saying, take it off. Just nod and smile, try to keep them calm, do the best you can, but do not take it off. Because if we do that, any clot that was forming, we're just gonna dislodge it, and it, we're gonna restart from the beginning, right, on how to stop this bleed. If you have an additional tourniquet, and he's bleeding, you can apply it above the first tourniquet, but we're not gonna remove the first one. If you don't, you've got your hands, you can always do direct pressure, okay? We're wearing gloves. You can get something absorbent like his shirt, your shirt, it doesn't really matter. But you can do direct pressure. You can do both. That's not wrong. So that's the tourniquet application. Remember, arms and legs, um, not the groin, not the underarms, and not the neck. Thank you You're very welcome. much. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. So the other part of compression, right? We did the tourniquet. We had the tourniquet, so we put it to use. And that's what it really comes down to. If you have a bleeding control kit, please use it. If you don't, use what you have available. Um, when it comes to wound packing, and I, I say the word packing because that's what we're going to do, right? Here is our faux extremity. Uh, this is supposed to represent a laceration. This is some type of penetrating injury here. And then the other side would be a GSW, a gunshot wound. Some people like to think of this as what used to be known as an entrance and exit wound um, but in today we just say wound one wound two okay so wound packing 
Wound pack the extremities, just like with the tourniquet. Arms and legs, you can pack in the groin and the underarms, that's not wrong. Uh, but the important part, and if you see this, is we're gonna do packing. I can't stress that word enough. This bottom one is what many of us want to do, right? You see it a lot on TV, but TV isn't always accurate. Um, however, it is entertaining. You come up on a person who is bleeding, you want to help, and that's great. We all want to help, and we all should help. You put your gloves on if you had the time. Um, we see they're bleeding. You take your gauze. We have gauze because we're in the medical field. You may have dirty socks. That's okay. The purpose is to keep the blood on the inside to keep this person alive. When you get them to the trauma center or whichever hospital is, we can treat the infection that you may or may not have caused. We want you to stop that bleeding. So take your, your material, I say absorbent material. You don't do this and push down. Um, you're helping and we appreciate that, we really do, but it's not what's best at this moment. So what we want you to do is open up the wound, because you can see, and just like in those pictures, on the outside it was a laceration, and on the inside it still is, it's just a very deep cavity, right? So if we do this, that cavity continues to fill up with blood. So we open, we take whatever our material is, and we pack that wound. We're gonna put it inside that wound until it is completely full, right? Once it is full, you can take more packing and place it on top. Now this packing acts as an extension of our fingers, right? It, it gets to places that we cannot. And there may be more than one bleeding vessel in there. So we pack as tightly as we can. So now we have pressure on all sides. Take your extra, put it down, and hold. And I want you to do two hands, one over the other, and push down. Some people want to do their fingers, but what happens is you're waiting a long time and you get really tired, okay? It doesn't take long for this to start to hurt even you. Again, wound packing hurts as well, just like putting on the tourniquet. So both hands, hold down. I like to tell people, go to their happy place, sing their favorite song. If you know Free Bird, sing it, because it's about 10 minutes long. Uh, and it can take up to 10 minutes for an arterial bleed to stop. What you don't want to do is peak. You don't want to say, how good of a job am I doing? Lift it up to see, okay? You're gonna relieve the pressure when you do that. So you hold it and you wait. You gotta, you're gonna have to zen out here and, until help arrives, okay? Um, another thing you don't do ever is remove the packing. Even if it's saturated, blood's still coming out, never remove the packing because you're just gonna dislodge whatever clots have formed just like with the tourniquet if you loosen that up. So if you have more material, you can take it, put it on top and push down, but do not remove it, okay? So that was compression, tourniquet usage, or wound packing. When it comes to torsos, we don't teach packing because there's a lot of vital organs here and we don't want you to be tickling organs that we shouldn't be. So those situations, those people need to be identified so that they can be the first ones to go to the hospital for definitive care, okay? We don't wanna, we don't wanna pack those wounds. We can't use a tourniquet on those wounds. They've got the internal bleeding and they need to go first. Remember, if you have the tourniquet on somebody, You've done your job, you've stopped that bleeding, we have given them time, and then they can go to the hospital next if it's a situation where there are multiple people. Um, I like to tell, I, I ask the question, when a car runs out of gas, how do you get it to go? And I know that nobody's here to answer, so I'm gonna give you the answer, and that might feel weird. So, if a car runs out of gas, I had one person tell me, well, you can push it. Yeah, you can push it. But what I wanted to know is how do you get the car to crank up and move on its own, right? Um, and the answer is it needs gas. You need to put gas back in the tank so that the car can move. It doesn't matter how many times we jump on the engine. It doesn't matter how many times we electrocute it. It doesn't matter how many times you turn that key. If you don't put gas in the engine or in the gas tank, it's not gonna start up. Our body's the same way. If we run out of blood, it doesn't matter how many compressions nursing and medical staff do. It doesn't matter how many times they shock us. If the blood isn't in there, if the volume isn't in there, and we are bleeding blood, we're not bleeding some of these other things that we give like normal saline or salt water, it's blood. If we don't have the blood, we're not gonna start back up. So the best way to give these people the best chance of survival is to find that bleed, stop the bleed, and get them to the hospital, okay? That's the whole purpose of this is, this person is bleeding, I need to stop it, keep the blood inside the vessels so that the heart will continue to pump it through and get oxygen to those organs. Once they start to die, we're in a world of hurt, okay? So we need to get these people identified. They're bleeding, I'm gonna stop it. And I'm not, you know, 
this information is to be comfortable. That's why we have these legs, because I don't want you all to come across these things, but if you do, I want you to have a little bit of, of comfort with it to say, okay, I remember that guy talking, I remember what he said, so I'm going to apply this information. There's no worse feeling than hopeless and helplessness. And in a situation when you're bleeding over a loved one or a student or whatever it might be, and you want to help but you don't know how, nothing feels worse than that. So at least if you have this basic bleeding control information, you can do something. And that's all we're trying to do is something. Something for these people to give them the best chance. you have any questions for me, Alan? I don't. Thank you very much. Uh, tell me a little bit about National Stop the Bleed Day and, and coming by tomorrow. So tomorrow is the first annual National Stop the Bleed Day. It's going to be on the 31st, so March 31st. We are going to be here at the mall, Westgate Mall, from 10 o'clock until 3 o'clock. Uh, if, if people are here, we're not going to leave you and be like, oh, well, sorry, we're out of here. It's 3 o'clock, and that's what we said. So um, we want you all to come by and learn this information. I don't want you to be you know, put off by it. It does make some people a little uneasy. But in a situation, this is just to get you comfortable so at least you can have an understanding of this is what I need to do. It may not be easy. You may have to face that fear, and that's what life's about, right? And what better time to face the fear than when somebody is literally depending on you to save their life? You're just going to have to dig down deep and do what you can, do what we teach you here to give you that little bit of comfort so you can get the job done. Guys, I appreciate it. I hope to see you all tomorrow. Um, if not, you can contact me via my email if you want to set up a Stop the Bleed for a school or an organization. Uh, we'll be happy to work with you all and get out there and teach your staff or, or just you as a person. Okay. Thank you.